hopefully I got my computer problems ironed out from last week. And so far, so good. Uh, so I, I ask that you keep praying that all go well. Uh, before I start sharing my screen, uh, I wanted to uh, let you know as far as the notes that we're sending out uh, each week. Now, and I put it in a format so that if you print out the notes or if uh, you don't have access to those type of uh, tech, that type of technology, Naomi. Yes. But the way I, the way I put them together is that each thing we're talking about, you should be able to go and pray through it. I don't, I, I, I don't want to just say at the end of this uh, series that you know, something that you can uh, use. And so you can put these in a binder, maybe put them in a three ring binder and each one you'll notice I, I define what it is. You know, we talked about praise so far. I defined what praise was. We talked about waiting, define that. Today, we're going to talk about confession, define that. Then I give a little scriptural teaching, just an outline on what that means. And then at the bottom of the sheet, I give a prayer of confession so that you can use that as a guide or a model. Uh, again, it's not meant, I mean, if you want to pray it uh, verbatim, you can do that, but you better be praying from the heart. You know, don't don't just be praying from the head or from the mouth. Uh, you know, pray from your heart, or, or you can just use this as a guide to help you to pray. So, you know, I, I would hope that you would print these off, uh, put them in a binder, and you can use them during your prayer time. You know, you can say, well, what what did Pastor Glaze mean when he talked about confession, or what did he mean when he talked about waiting? And Pastor Glaze is so bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that he even gave me a prayer. He showed he he even gave me a prayer to show me how to pray. So, uh, you know, hopefully these will be valuable to you. Now, uh, let me make this announcement, and, and Naomi uh, may want to uh, uh, take note of this also because I didn't tell her until just now, and that is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be in Philadelphia next week. I'll be doing a revival in Philadelphia next week. So there'll be no afternoon. The army to send uh, email. Kind of freezing up a little bit. Pardon me? Kind of freezing up a little bit in your sentences. Oh, I am? must be uh i don't know what it is okay. is it still freezing you're okay right now okay i, I hope it's not this computer i hope it's not either <laughs> just keep talking all right okay. well you know the other thing too uh, somebody told me that if you're in a building where a bunch of people are on the internet that can cause you to have difficulty so uh you know when i was uh doing from home i didn't seem to have a lot of problems but you know maybe this is a lot of uh, a lot of things going on here at the church, which is a good thing. Am I still good? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so pray for me. Uh, next week I'll be doing a revival in Philadelphia. Uh, just pray for my strength, and uh, I'll I'll be preaching uh, seven times. So just pray that my 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 voice uh, holds up, and that the Lord keeps me healthy. All right, let me go ahead and share. And Naomi, let me know if uh, things not working right. Okay. We're good. All right. Okay, so yeah, again, Naomi, if 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 it seems like something is happening, just let me know, uh, and, and you're probably gonna have to tell me because I I turned my screen off where the uh, where I can see everybody. Okay. All right. So, 
uh, the hour that changes the world. Uh, we've looked at praise. We've looked at waiting. And today we come to confession. Uh, as we look at the word confession, the word confess, uh, and I, you know, y'all, y'all know me. I like to use these Greek words, but uh, I don't use them to try to uh, show off. Uh, I try to use them when they have a particular meaning that I'm trying to bring out. All right, and so the word confess is from the Greek word homologeo, uh, which literally means homo. You know, we we all are familiar with that term, term, term homo. It means same. And lego, which means to speak or it means word. All right. So, so the word homologeo is translated to say the same thing. All right. That's what that word means. When the word confess means to say the same thing. So when we confess our sins to God, we are agreeing with him according to his word, that we are saying the same thing that God says. Yo, for instance, if I go out and I get drunk and I realize that I got drunk and I come and I confess to God, what am I doing? I'm saying the same thing that God says in his word. What does God say in his word? That drunkenness is a sin. So when I confess it, I'm saying, Lord, I confess to you that I have gotten drunk and I know that it's a sin. That's what confession means. It means to say the same thing that God says, that if if God says that I shouldn't steal and I go out and steal something, then when I confess it, I'm saying the same thing that God says. Um, he says in his word that it's a sin. He said it's wrong. Uh, if I gossip, uh, watch yourself now, preacher. <laughs> watch yourself. Uh, and God says in his word uh, that I shouldn't do it. Then I confess I'm saying the same thing that God says. All right. So that's what the word confession means, that word homologeo. All right. Uh, in the book, on page 48, the author says that confession is spiritual surgery. He says, just as a surgeon lances a boil to permit the infection to drain and to, to heal from the inside, so confession opens the sore, drains, oh man, whoo, that's some good stuff, man. Drains the poison and heals from within. See, what is he saying here? He's saying that when we sin, there's something that happens on the inside. And confession helps us to get it out. Confession helps us. Well, let me let me let me get I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna come back to this, but let me give you a perfect example. And that is Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Confession is getting the poison out of your soul, the spiritual poison out of your soul. Look what this says. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Look at this. When I kept silent, when I didn't confess, when I held it in, my bones racks old through my roaring all day long. For night and day, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture, you know, when you talk about your moisture, that, that means your life. That means your energy. My moisture was turned to the drought of summer. Wow. Now, uh, a lot of people uh, believe that the background to this particular psalm is when David committed sin, sin with Bathsheba and he was in sin and he didn't confess it to the Lord. You know, when you think about what David did, uh, he committed adultery with a man's wife. 
he had a man uh, get drunk. All right. He got a man drunk. Uh, he sent that man to the front line and he was murdered. So David had a lot of blood on his hands. And David didn't confess it. Well, how do we know he didn't confess it? Because we see later on that the prophet Nathan came to David and he gave David a parable about a man who had taken sheep from another man. And uh, and David said, cursed be that man. You know, he's going to pay, I forget what it was, threefold, fourfold, fivefold. I forget what it is right now. Uh, and, 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 and the prophet said to David, you are the man. <laughs> so what does that tell us, saints? That tells us that David, after he had committed adultery, after he got a man drunk, after he had a man murdered, that he didn't confess it, that he kept it in. And notice he didn't confess it until he was confronted by the prophet. And, and, and God was going to take David's life. If you go back and read that passage of scripture where he's confronted by Nathan, the prophet, God was going to take David's life because he hadn't confessed it. And so here in Psalm 32, many believe that this is David's confession of his sin. And notice when he didn't confess, look what he said. When I kept silence, my bones racked wax old through my roaring all the day long he said you know it felt like my bones just were aching you know when i didn't confess it that it seemed like my whole inner being was 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 just in, in mourning and groaning he said for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me and my moisture is turned to the drought of summer Right again, his energy, his spiritual life, his zest, his enthusiasm. He said it had turned to the drought of summer. Now, notice what he says after this, verse five. For I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. How did he get that poison out of, ooh, man, my goodness. How did he get that poison out of his soul? He confessed it. Notice what he said in verse one. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. You know, it's almost like, have you ever seen a balloon or have you ever blown up a balloon and you didn't tie it into a knot? but you held on to the end. And as long as you squeeze the end where you blew into the, the your air into the balloon, as long as you squeeze it tight, the balloon stays blowed up. But what happens when you start letting some of the pressure off of that place where you blew the balloon up? The air starts coming out, right? And the bo balloon starts to deflate. Well, that's what confession is. You know, when sin is in our soul, it builds up and it's a lot of pressure. But when we confess, oh, somebody, somebody help me now. Somebody help me now. When we confess, it's like taking the pressure off of the end of the balloon and letting the air out. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. It's like taking the pressure off the end of the balloon and letting the air out. And that's what David said. You know, it's almost like, can, if, if you can imagine, uh, like this. Like, he's holding it in, right? He's holding his breath. He's holding his breath. And then when he confesses and God forgives him, it's like he goes, ah. he's able to exhale. He's able to let, as, as we see here, uh, he's able to let that poison out from within so that's what confession is again let me read what it says in the book quote by harold linsell just as the surgeon lances a boil to permit the infection to drain and to heal from the inside 
So confession opens the sore, drains the poison, and heals from within. So Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5, uh, it lets us know that we can release this uh, poison that's in the soul. All right, now what I'd like to do is go to Psalm 51. And Psalm 51, just like Psalm 32, is a confession of David. And in Psalm 51, David confesses his sin. So we see in two places where David confessed his sin with Bathsheba, with getting Uriah drunk, with having Uriah murdered. All right. So if we are going to confess and be forgiven, uh, Psalm 51 tells us how to do that. So I pray, saints, and, and you know, now I'm going to say something, and you might not agree with this, but I believe that we we confess we should confess every day why have you have you had the wrong thoughts have you did something that you weren't supposed to do have you said something that you shouldn't have said then you ought to confess that to the lord you know i, I you know there, there are some things you know that we don't have to get down on our face and weep and cry even though that might not be a bad idea, you know, because if you go back to the Old Testament, a lot of times when they confessed, uh, they they confessed with sackcloth and ashes. You know, what was that? That was a sign of mourning. Whenever they confessed and repented with sackcloth and ashes, they, they were uh, repenting and they were mourning. You know, that sackcloth was kind of rough and you put that on your skin right and that kind of made you uncomfortable uh and it re it reminded you that you were in a, a state of repentance that you were repenting and then the ashes ashes are a sign of mourning so when they repented in sackcloth and ashes that you know that was the roughness and and the mourning that they would do so you know sometimes it might not be a bad idea to come before the lord with tears and and weeping you know and, and and maybe well let's say in two ways right you know first of all for any personal sins that you have committed you know again such as things that you have thought things that, that you have said things that you have done you know anything personally uh that touches your life you you may but then just in general to see in general what sin has done you know when you look at uh you know there there was a account i think it was in uh georgia somewhere where one of the uh, illegal immigrants uh killed a lady right what what you know sin makes a person do that you know when you look at you know people going into the mall or going into the school going into a public place and shooting people that's that's a result of sin when you look at children that are being abused when you look at wives that are being abused that's a result of sin and so there is the weeping in general over what sin does in John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, before he raised Lazarus, the Bible says Jesus wept. All right. Now, let me ask you a question. I don't know if you ever thought of this before. Why did Jesus weep? Why did he weep? Well, many theologians say that the reason Jesus wept was because of sin. Because of what sin had 
did to his friend Lazarus because he was calling Lazarus to come forth out of heaven or paradise into a sinful world. And so some people say, well, why did Jesus weep? He wept because of sin. So there are two realms in which we weep. We weep over our own personal sins, but we also weep over sin in general and, and what is done to people, what is done to our world, what is done to society. So when you confess and you want to get right with God, let me give you one, two, three, four, five things that you can do from Psalm 51 to get right with God. The first thing we see is that you go around the bend of brokenness. You go around the bend of brokenness. Uh, look what he says in verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 51. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. Somebody hear me now, saints. Somebody hear me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. The first rung in confession is brokenness. That if I said something that I shouldn't say it, I should be broken about that. You know, I should say, oh, God, I shouldn't have said that. Or if I do something that I shouldn't do, oh, God, I shouldn't have did that. There should be the idea of brokenness. You see, it would have been very easy for David to get an animal sacrifice and offer it to God, right? Go out there and get a lamb. Go out there and get a cow. Go out there and get a dove. Just go get it and offer it up. And then keep on about your business. That's not what God wanted. Even though they had the sacrificial system where they were to offer sacrifices for sin, even though that was the case, and even though David could have very easily have done that, that's not what God was looking for. What was God looking for before he gave his offering? The sacrifice that David needed to bring was a broken spirit, one that was empty of self-effort and a contrite heart, one that felt and expressed deep remorse over sin. Yeah, I think that sometimes God's people take sin too lightly. I know, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm just going to confess. I think sometimes I do. You know, again, nobody likes to laugh more than me. Nobody likes to tell a joke more than me. And, you know, sometimes we watch these funny television shows. And in some instances, they're filled with sin, right? Some Somebody's doing something wrong. And we laugh at it. Now, again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with watching sitcoms. So don't get to, don't walk away saying, Pastor Glaze said I shouldn't watch. No, that's because I, I watch them. But I'm just saying, I think sometimes there's a tendency when we see things that are wrong that we don't think, give a second thought to laughing about it. And maybe that kind of spills over into our own personal lives where we do things that's wrong and we take it lightly. That we need to realize that all sin is first of all, well, let me, let me read this. This is going to blow your mind now, saints. This is going to blow your mind if you, if you didn't realize this. Right. Or if you didn't notice, this is going to blow your mind. 
David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Wait a minute. You, you committed adultery with a lady. You slept with another man's wife. Against thee and thee only have I committed this sin. Uh, wait, wait a minute, D David, you got a man drunk. Against thee and thee only have I committed this sin. Uh, wait, wait a minute, David, you, you had a man murdered. You committed a sin against a man and his wife. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And so we see here that David recognized and realized that first and foremost, his sin was against God. Do you realize that? That, yeah, you might sin against other people, but first and foremost, your sin is against God. And so there should be that idea of brokenness when we come before him and we confess our sins to him. Let me move on. I could stay there a long time. You know, we could talk about brokenness for a long time, uh, but let me move on. You got to go down the contour of confession, right? Uh, Psalm 51, verses three through six. Let me read this. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me know wisdom. Now notice David says, uh, in sin did my mother conceive me. Well, that doesn't mean that the act of conception was sin. That means with a sin nature. So I tell people all the time, we are sinners in two ways. You might want to write this down if, you, if you're writing, taking notes. Or as, as I like to say on Sunday morning, if you're tweeting, you could tweet this one, right? That we are sinners by birth. We were born with a sin nature, but we are also sinners by choice that we choose to sin. So not only were we born sinners, but we choose to sin on a regular basis. You got to go down the concourse of confession. We see that David accepted the responsibility for his sin. I acknowledge my transgression, verse 3. Do you accept the responsibility for your sin? See, and, and this comes to uh, the place where a lot of people don't think that they've done any wrong. You know, you know what? There's a lot of people. I, I, I didn't realize this, but there's a lot of people that think they don't do wrong, right? Uh, there's some people that think they don't sin. And John, John said, if you say that you don't sin, you're a liar. <laughs> and the truth is not in you. We all sin. And so we need to accept the responsibility of our sin. I remember uh, there was a, a, a time when I was on the road uh, quite a bit. I was preaching, uh, teaching, going out to eat, you know, uh, being on the road. You know, you got to go eat somewhere. So, you know, I was going out to places to eat every night, having big meals and uh, enjoying the food and not exercising. And I, I was doing this over a period of time. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I started having certain symptoms that were concerning me. And I went to the doctor and he ran some tests and did some things. And he said, you got diabetes. And I remember calling my wife, you know, right after I left the doctor's office and telling her what he said. But you know what my words to my wife were? I don't have any body the blame but myself 
yeah, I understand that, you know, diabetes runs in my family. I understand that. Uh, uh, so, you know, so some of it can be contributed to that. But the fact of the matter is that until I, I started uh, being a part of an unhealthy lifestyle, that, you know, I was it was pretty much under control. Right. But then when I was eating whatever I want, not exercising, uh, eating all the wrong things, sweets, drinking all kind of, you know, drinks that I shouldn't, not, not alcohol now, I'm letting you know that, but drinking all kind of drinks that I probably shouldn't have been drinking. Uh, that's when it got out of control. And so I came to the conclusion and, uh, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to blame McDonald's for putting extra sugar in, in their drinks. You know, I, I wasn't going to blame, uh, the food companies for put, putting certain additives, even though that might be true. I wasn't going to blame, uh, any, I, I took responsibility. I said, I am in this predicament because I put myself in this predicament. And so when you, when you're dealing with sin in your life, you've got to accept the responsibility. And you can't cast it off on somebody else. Notice that he didn't try to sweep his sin under a rug. <laughs> Look what he said. My sin is ever before me. Right? My sin is ever before me. That he he realized that it was there looking him in the face. And that he had to deal with it. As I said earlier, he saw his sin as an offense against God. He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And then he avoided self-justification. He said that you might be justified when you speak and clear when you judge. That, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to justify myself at all. You know, that's, uh, that's not what I'm trying to do. So, saints, when it comes down to confession, you got to go down the concourse of confession. Next, you got to merge on the freeway of forgiveness. Notice what he says in verse one. He requests the Lord to blot out his transgressions. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So he's he's asking God for forgiveness. Notice in verse nine, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So once you've been broken, oh man, there's some good stuff, man. I tell you what, I, I'm not saying it because I'm teaching. I'm just saying it because of the word of God, right? This is some good stuff that I'm giving you this afternoon. That if you really want to confess that you have to, Go by the way of brokenness. You got to be broken. Then you got to go by the concourse of confession. And now we come to the freeway of forgiveness. And that's where you ask God to forgive you. You ask God to blot out your transgressions. You ask God to hide his face from your iniquities. Merge onto the freeway of forgiveness. And then I like, oh, this, this next one is powerful. What I'm getting ready to share with you now, this next one is powerful. You got to stop at the corner of cleansing. You got to stop at the corner of cleansing. Notice the three types of cleansing that he talks about. Legal cleansing, spiritual cleansing, and ritual cleansing. Legal cleansing is for justification where you're made right with God. The phrase blot out in verse one, blot out my transgressions, right? Can be compared to legal records in which a criminal can have his record or her record expunged. That means that you are no longer held responsible for it, that it's been taken off. You know, one of the shows that I like to watch is Judge Mathis. And uh, Judge Mathis got into a lot of trouble 
when he was growing up. And Judge Mathis, you know, had a record. He had a criminal record. And I'm not sure all that he did, but Judge Mathis got his record expunged, which means that they took it away, right? And when we come to God for cleansing during our time of confession, that he justifies us, that he doesn't hold, oh my God. He doesn't hold it against us, right? He doesn't hold it over our head and say, remember when you did this? Remember when you did that? He justifies us. He declares us right. Secondly, we see spiritual cleansing, and that is for sanctification. Uh, justification is how to get right with God. <laughs> sanctification is how to stay right with God, right? Several times David asked, wash me, wash me. This term was used when washing clothes or washing a garment where you wash the dirt out of it. See, in legal cleansing, that's a legal thing that God declares you forgiven, right? God declares you cleansed. But here, you know, the little habits and the little uh, vices that we pick up, you know, God is able to wash us from those things. You know, the, the we, we call them the little white lies, you know, that uh, God, you know, it's still a lie, right? It's still a lie that God is able to wash us from that. You know, so there's a spiritual cleansing. And then there's the ritual cleansing. And this is uh, in order for a person's worship to be accepted, they had to be ceremonial clean where you could worship God, right? And, and so in 1 John uh, 1, 9, you know, it says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this, this cleansing puts us in a place where we can fellowship with God, where we can worship God. You know, why, why do we confess our sins? I mean, if Jesus died on the cross and all of our sins were forgiven, then, and what about the times that you forget to confess your sin? Does that mean that you, that he doesn't cleanse you from them? Well, confession more is not necessarily for forgiveness of sin because we've already been forgiven by the blood of Christ. As a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says that, uh, that we've been made clean by the blood of Christ, that we've been washed by the blood of Christ. So what happens when we sin? When we sin, the fellowship with God has been broken. And when our fellowship with God is broken, we have to come to him and ask for cleansing when our fellowship has been broken. I give this illustration. Suppose me and my son, when he was growing up, were throwing a baseball in our yard back and forth. And we were just having a good time. You know, we were talking and laughing and joking, throwing the ball back and forth. And then all of a sudden, my son misses the ball when I throw it to him. And he gets mad because he misses the ball. And so he goes to get the ball, and he's mad. And he just throws the ball, and it goes through the neighbor's window. And, it's, and he breaks the neighbor's window. Now, do I come over to my son and say, son, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud that you got missed the ball. You got mad and broke the neighbor's window. As a matter of fact, here goes another ball, son. Let's just continue to throw the ball back and forth. Is that what I do? No, a good dad is not going to do that. A good dad is going to say what? The fellowship has been broken. We can't keep throwing the ball like we were throwing. You broke somebody's window. We got to stop and deal with that. And then once we stop and we deal with it, then 
we can get back to throwing the ball. Well, it's the same thing with God, that we have this sweet fellowship with God going back and forth. And then when we sin, the fellowship is broken. And the fellowship is not restored until we confess. So confession becomes a way of restoring our fellowship with God. Because at that point, we have that ritual cleansing, right? That, that ritualistic cleansing where we can be ceremonially clean and we're able to come and worship God. We're able to continue our fellowship with him. Let me move on. We got to stop at the corner of restoration, you know, and that is to let God know that he has restored us. Uh, look at verse 10, creating me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, so, you know, we're being restored. A clean heart is restoration. A right spirit is restoration. Uh, we've been restored to fellowship. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So again, look at this. Remember I told you, just told you that illustration about me and my son, that whenever uh, that he throws that ball through the window, the fellowship has been broken. And look what David said. David said that our fellowship was broken. He said, cast me not from thy presence. Lord, don't, don't, don't take away the fellowship. Uh, and, and don't take your spirit from me, right? So the, uh, when we stop by the road of restoration, the fellowship is restored. The joy is restored, right? When my son throws that ball through the window, is the joy is gone. We're, we're not laughing and joking anymore. We got to deal with this. And notice what David said when he's being restored. Verse 12, uh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. See, when you confess the right way, God will, God will restore the joy to you. And then notice he says, give me a right spirit. Uh, restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with a right spirit. Uh, a spirit does, that does not fall prey to evil desires and passions. And then let me close with this right here. Uh, winding, wind down. Okay, I didn't, I didn't put that in to the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, but uh, uh, this is on your notes. So you got something in your notes. Uh, okay, yeah, we got that. Uh, wind down to the road of restoration. All right, yeah, we got them all. All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, now, uh, let me let me uh, give you this before I give you my prayer. Uh, this was an evening prayer uh, that was found in the in the hymn book. And I love this. And you might want to go to a hymn book. You, As a matter of fact, you probably go online and uh, type an evening prayer. And you can get this prayer. And th th this is true confession. Look at this. If I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused one foot to grow as go astray, if I have walked in my own willful way, dear Lord, forgive. How about you, my friend? Have you wounded any soul today? Have you caused somebody to go astray? Have you walked in your own willful way? Dear Lord, forgive. If I have uttered idle words or vain, if I have turned aside from want or pain, lest I offend some other through strain, dear Lord, forgive. How about you, my friend? Have you uttered any idle words? Have you turned aside from pain when God was trying to teach you something? Have you offended somebody today? Dear Lord, forgive. If I have been perverse or hard or cold, if I have longed for shelter in the fold, when thou hast given some fort to hold, dear Lord, forgive. Have you been short with somebody today? Have you been hard? Have you been cold to somebody? Have you turned a cold shoulder to somebody? Have you longed to, uh, for the peace and uh, comfort of sin? Have God called you to stand up and speak up and give a testimony and you didn't do it? 
Dear Lord, forgive. Forgive the sins I confess to thee. Forgive the sins I do not see. O oh, guide me, love me, and my keeper be. Dear Lord, forgive. Have you confessed the sins that the Lord has brought to your attention? Have you confessed in Psalm 19, the psalmist confessed the secret sins, the ones that I don't even know about? Have you confessed those to the Lord? Dear Lord, forgive. That's the evening prayer. Uh, again, that's in many of the hymn books. Uh, but it's on, you can, you as a matter of fact, you can get it online. I just checked. Uh, you can go online and, uh, and get this prayer. And let me, if you have your notes that Naomi sent out, uh, at the bottom of it is a prayer confession. I, I wrote this prayer and I use this prayer in my prayer time. When I come to confession, again, this is not meant for you to read verbatim. It's meant to be a guide. Now, again, if you want to read it verbatim and you're praying from the heart, that's another thing. But it's just not meant to be read and say, well, let me move on to the next thing. Dear Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I have sinned. And it has affected my, re my fellowship with you. As I reflect upon my life, please reveal to me any sin in word, thought, or deed that I have committed against you or my fellow man. As you bring these sins to my mind, I acknowledge them in agreement with you. Please forgive me for committing them and wash my soul clean from their stains. Give me wisdom to turn away from them and the strength to not continue to repeat them. I not only ask for your forgiveness, I also request full restoration of fellowship with you. Show me how to make things right with those whom I've offended and make restitution when necessary. So I, I just want to say again that these sheets that I'm sending you that you should be able to put them in a binder. And when you come to your prayer time, you can go through each one and say, well, what did he mean by praise? And how do I praise? What did he mean by waiting? And how do I wait? What did he mean by confession? And how do I confess? And you'll have it all right there before you in your prayer time. I'm going to tell you, saints, this will revolutionize your prayer life. All right, it'll revolutionize your prayer life. Your prayer life will not be the same, especially if you pray it from the heart. Now, again, let me uh, stop sharing my screen. And uh, I, I want to remind you that we're not going to be here uh, next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. You don't want to miss the following Wednesday. And call Phone a friend. You ever watch that show that's, what, the Million Dollar Pyramid? One of the uh, lifeline, lifelines. Phone a friend. Phone a friend. We're going to be talking about scripture praying. This is something that every child of God should be doing. And yet and still, I don't, I, don't see it, I don't see it happening. We're going to learn how to scripture pray. You know, sometimes you may notice on Sunday mornings when I pray, I'll, I might, I'll scripture pray. I'll, I'll turn to a specific scripture and I'll pray that scripture back to the Lord. And, 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 and so we want to learn how to scripture pray. So again, phone a friend. All right. Uh, Charles Purcell.